Um, I want to talk about your devotional guide. Has anyone turned it in yet? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's due in a minute. It's due in one minute. It's due in one minute. <laughs> well, I was going to give you another day. Um, okay, so if I, if I gave you, if I gave you, honestly, I was going to give you two days, honestly. Um, now, if I did that, do you guys know how would you retrieve your project then? We could just resubmit it. Resubmit it. You just have to unlock the, the, the thing again. All right. It's unlocked. Because Josh came and saw me last night, and I was... I was a little, I could tell he worked hard. Um, it wasn't exactly formatted the way that I kind of wanted it. He had some really good stuff, and I thought, you know, there may be more people that have a misunderstanding about it, too. I, it, you know, to me, guys, I, to me, two days isn't a big deal. I just, I want a good project from him. You know, I, I want you guys, I think this is a great project, by the way, to be able to do this. And I'm going to tell you why. I think it also should help you in your own personal Bible study that you begin um, to, th this is kind of, the way that you're going to set up this devotional would be, in a way, the way you should have your devotions uh, a little bit. So, um, is it okay if I give you two more days? Yes. Are you yes. okay yes, with that? Please. Obviously, you're going to have something to begin with. So, if you did submit something, you're not reinventing the wheel, all right? You you can go like, okay, I just need to tweak this. I really want a really good project, and I think this is a this is a project that it's worth spending some time on. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get started. Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity uh, to meet on the Book of Joshua. We have much to cover today. We do take a moment. And uh, pray for Jody's uh, sister. We pray for Ayana as she is recovering. Well, she's not recovering, Lord. I'm glad she doesn't have any symptoms. And I pray that Ayana will be good. I pray for Jody's sister that she, Maggie, that she'll um, she'll recover well with the surgery. We take a moment on the eve of the election. The majority of Americans have already voted, and we just pray for your mercy, God, on our land. Father, please don't give us what we deserve. I pray that you'll give us mercy so that we will see a revival in America. That, Father, that we would do our part. Lord, we don't believe that tomorrow's the answer to America. We do believe, though, Father, that who is elected will give us the freedom to get the answer out. And so, Lord, we pray that the leaders over us, men and women, will allow us to live godly, peaceable lives so we can present the gospel. Lord, turn the church back around to you. I pray in Jesus' name that the election results will not be what we deserve, but it will be evident that you are merciful to us and you give us an opportunity to serve you. Lord, I think of this college, I think of churches, I think of religious freedom, pro-life, our view towards Israel. Lord, it's not about voting on a man or a woman. It's voting on these platforms. And Lord, I pray that righteousness will reign tomorrow that those that are elected and propositions that are passed would reflect more godliness. And then work in our hearts, Lord, as the church, that if we're given mercy tomorrow, that we would utilize that for the cause of Christ. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Could I have uh, two more men pray as well for the election tomorrow? Jimmy, Father, Lord, Pray for your mercy on this country, Lord. The last thing we deserve is to have a and four more years of grace, God. But please, God, give us some more grace that we can work with. Uh, we don't deserve. 
deserve it. I just pray for this country, Lord. It was founded on biblical principles, but it seems to be turning away from those very biblical principles it was founded on. Please help there to be a revival in the heart of every every Christian. That way the revival can spread into the heart of the nation. Help the rest of this class period, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this day today that you've given to us. I thank you for, for what you have done what you're continuing to do, Lord. Pray especially for our country today, Lord, as the election's coming up, as you know already. Pray that whatever the results will be, Lord, that it would, it would be your will, your, for your, your honor and glory, however that would work best. Lord, I pray that you would bring a revival in us, Lord. Help us to realize and understand, Lord, that, that it's, it's, it needs to be a personal thing first, Lord, that we need to have a fresh perspective of who you are. Come into your presence, Lord. Revive us personally with you, Lord. Give us that new perspective, Lord. That, that's, that's really all that matters in this life is, is us growing closer to you and then how we display that to others. And help us to be a light for others, Lord, um, with, that, with whatever the results may be with this election, Lord, that, that we can be a light um, with, with how, we, how we act, how we respond to the circumstances and the trials that will come our way, Lord. I pray that in everything that we, we do, uh, you would help us to keep you on the forefront of our mind, Lord, to bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, man. Okay, uh, very quick in review, I want to go over uh, Joshua chapter... Oh, thank you, thank you. During our break time, if uh, you did not get a stone before, if you would like to get a memorial stone, and we'll kind of explain that we got our whites here. Yeah, way to go. Good job, Brother Bundy. Thanks. Everything's right in there. Okay, um, so we talked about what are biblical memorials. They're objects, events, or scriptures which are designed to cause us to remember God's supernatural power, provision, or his protection. So something, uh, it's an object, an event, maybe a day every year that you just, it's a memorial day. Uh, maybe it's a place. Maybe it's a passage of scripture. I know in my life I have many scriptures that were just memorials. I, I hear that verse said, or I look at that verse, and it's like a memorial. So we got some, you guys got your, did you, how many, how many put a verse on your rock? Okay, and um, it's just, you, you look at the rock, it's a, why do you, hey, so that you can see these rocks, these pile of rocks, uh, that's why he had them uh, build that after they crossed the, uh, the Jordan River, uh, to remember. Um, to remember what? Um, designed to cause us to remember God's supernatural power. That was God that got us over the Jordan River. I don't want you to ever forget that. His provision. I provided you this promised land. And I protected you. You could have all been killed. And I protected you. So it, it, they, they said put together the rocks. By the way, how many tribes are there? Thirteen. How many rocks were there? Twelve. Twelve. Okay, I'm leading something there. Okay, so we'll get that a little later. Why does God want us to set up memorials um, to let the next generation know what God can do for them? To never worship, yeah, okay, a couple things I thought were really good on number two. Never worship the object, never, never, never. To let the next generation know as a testimony to the world, I think it's really important. And um, accountability to what God has done for us. And so we will not forget God's hands in our life. You know, we really go, by the way, what is the greatest memorial in the Christian life that we celebrate? And it is a memorial. What? But what's the memorial of our salvation? Salvation is the thing. What's the memorial, Josh? The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. We take the juice to remember Christ blood, his death, right? And then, um, well, the bread, his body, um, and that he did for us, that, that we got saved. But really, uh, the Lord's Supper is a memorial meal. It's to remember what Christ has done. Um, actually, that's a really good. Uh, remembering what God has done brings, uh, these are so good, brings humility. Hey, Lord, it was you, it was not me. I think it brings boldness. You did it before, you could do it again. I always think about David with the lion and the bear. It brings encouragement. 
God, your grace has always been sufficient. I know it will be in this. It brings responsibility, and I think it brings motivation of love uh, as well. Okay, but, so we talk about memorials. So, God, so we're supposed to kind of think a lot about the past. There. No, we are not. Six reasons why we should net and why we should forget a bad past. That is, by the way, do you remember the two reasons? The only two reasons why we should ever go to our past. Remember? Only two reasons, Emily. Remembering the lessons God has taught us and remembering us the love, the love that God has shown us. Amen, Emily. That is fabulous. There's only two reasons why we ever go to our past. To remember the lessons God's taught us. Who wants us to remember that? And number two, to remember the love that God has shown us. That he's shown us his love. Oh, those are good times to go to the past. Those are great things to, to look at and to remember. Um, why, we, why we shouldn't, six reasons why we should forget a bad past. There's, by the way, there's no scriptural basis in the Bible to ever go to a bad past. The rocks and memorials, that's a good thing. But there's no scriptural basis for a bad past. We don't remember the past right. We tend to, we, we, we tend to uh, be subjective and selective. A bad past hurts. Uh, a bad past hurts. God doesn't want us to continue. Uh, but it doesn't help us. We can't, you can't go forward and backward at the same time. We did all these, right? We covered all these, okay? You can't change the past, so why live there? Guys, don't remember a bad past. You become the focus of the hurt instead of God becoming the focus of the healing. And that is so important. People who live in a bad past continue to focus on their hurt instead of moving on and letting God's healing be the focus. Woo, that is so true. I preach a message entitled, I Don't Live There Anymore. And i got to tell you, I never preach that message where people don't come up to, and to Dr. Shetler, I have just lived in my past. I need to move on. You absolutely do. Okay, so here we go now. Principles to victory. Um, four days at Gilgal. Take your Bibles and turn down to Joshua chapter 5. Now, Joshua chapter 4 is part of this whole deal because in Joshua chapter 4 at Gilgal, they put up the stones. There are four events. Now, in your introduction, it says, after crossing the Jordan, three incredibly important events. Well, cross out three and put down four. There's really four incredible events that took place at Gilgal. Now, this is what I believe, Kyler. You may not agree with me, but this is what I believe. I believe the most important chapter in the entire book of Joshua is Joshua chapter 5. Now, many people would say it's got to be Joshua chapter 3 when they cross the, Red, the, the Jordan River and they get into the Promised Land. I could see that argument. I don't have a big deal with this. But I think everything hinges on their victory with the four things that occurred at Gilgal. And um, they're just amazing. So we get your Bibles, open to Joshua chapter 5. Let's read it together today. Let's start with Emily in the back row. We'll go down that back row, and then we'll come through by Josh, and we'll go up Jake and Jordan, and then I'll decide where to go, over here or over there. We'll figure it out. All right, let's begin Joshua chapter 5, verse number 1. Lord, bless the reading and the studying of your word now. Go ahead, Emily, you got verse number one. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. Okay, good that, very nice. Okay, now listen. So, the word gets out. They cross the Jordan on dry ground during the flood season. All the nations that are existing in the promised land hear this. What are they feeling? What are they experiencing? Jody, what are they experiencing? They, they, 
Everyone, all these enemy nations just found out. Did you hear? Israel crossed on dry ground over the Jordan during the flood season. What are they sensing, Jody? Wait, I didn't hear that. What do you think those people are thinking? What would you be thinking? If your enemy just crossed over on dry ground during the flood season, whoa, whoa oh boy. They're afraid what? Israel might come. Yeah. Does Israel, everyone, help me. Does Israel have momentum right now? Oh, yeah. Things are moving. Things are going now. It's like, whoa, this is the time to move. This is the time to go forward. Let's see what happens. Verse number two. So, wow, you got all the nations scared to death right now. Hey, if you're going to conquer this country, man, conquer it right now. Let's see what happens. Verse number two. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Yeah. <laughs> That is not the verse you just kind of think would go right there. They cross over. I mean, you ever see a verse that doesn't place right? There it is. Wait, 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 wait. We just crossed over the Jordan on dry ground. We got everyone scared to death. And God says, yeah, you know what you should do. Make sharp knives. And circumcise all your men. Wait, let's get a few victories, okay? Okay. By the way, circumcise the second time. What does that mean? Okay. So I know we got to be. I don't want to be. I don't want to be graphic, but it's the Bible, so we got to talk about this for a minute, okay? Okay. You can't get circumcised the second time. All right. So what does it mean the second time? Yes. This is like the second mass event of them doing it. Of them all being circumcised. Say that again. This is like the second event of all of them being circumcised. Yes. Correct. Okay. So nobody's been circumcised for 39 years. Nobody. No male has been circumcised for 39. They did it when they first came out uh, 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 of Egypt. Now they go 39 years. Nobody's been circumcised. Okay. What? I'm sorry, but it's the Bible, so we got to talk about this. You circumcise all of the soldiers. What does that mean? What happens to all of Israel? For, for a week? Two weeks? Recovery time? What happens? They're vulnerable. That is the word I wanted. Do you understand something, guys? I know you never thought about this before. Actually, I really don't. Well, it's Bible, so you got to get this. Do you realize that all of those warriors being circumcised, that they are totally vulnerable for at least a week to ten days? Any nation could have came in and wiped Israel out during this time. They are absolutely vulnerable. I think that is the coolest thing. Because what are they going to have to live by? Josh, what are they going to have to live by? They're going to have to live by faith. They're going to have to trust God. Nobody in this room ever likes to be what? Vulnerable. We don't like that. We do not like it when we're not in control. I think this is the coolest thing. The promise, let, what's the theme of the book of Joshua? Victory. Right. Crossing over Jordan. Jordan is like what passage of scripture? Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. Now, guys, now we're getting into this now. They cross the Jordan, and the very first thing that God says is, hey, hey, circumcise everyone. Circumcise all your men right now. No. We're going to be, they can come down and all kill us. You trust me for that. I'm telling you it's time for you guys to start obeying. You should have been doing this for the last 39 years. And you haven't been living right, and now you're going to do it. 
We're going nowhere in the victorious Christian life until we start obeying God. That's going to be our first step. Wow. Guys, I will tell you what we just read is pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Verse number three. Let's go, Josh. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. Hill of the foreskins has another name. What would be the name? Gilgal. That's what it means. Gilgal. So now you know what Gilgal means. The hill of the foreskins. Gilgal. All right, verse four. Let's go to Josh. And this is the cause why Joshua is circumcised. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Okay, we got to keep reading a few more. Ver Unless anyone's got a comment, question, illustration? All right, go ahead, McKenna. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness mm -hmm. by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. Okay, so you got 39 years. Go ahead. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, so all the people that were men of war who came out of Egypt, Egypt were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, and to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land, which the Lord swore unto the fathers that he would give us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Okay, you ain't getting the promise until you, until you start the obedience. Guys, this is huge, what we're teaching right now. This is huge to our victorious Christian life. You're not getting the promised land until you start obeying. You have got to do the commandments of God. God's, by the way, by the way, let's, what, is, what, what did circumcision represent? What did it represent? For, for Israel, what, what? It was the sign of the covenant. It was, you're, you're my covenant people. And the sign of that covenant is circumcision. Jody, you got the next one, girl. Wait a second, what verse are you reading? I just can't hear you. Seven. Seven. Go. And their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. Okay, let's keep going. Go ahead, Jay. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that verse. These guys are totally vulnerable. And they got to trust God because that's where it all starts. When you begin Galatians 2.20 in your life and you really die to yourself, you become very vulnerable. Many of you have gotten, the student body has gotten so many things right with so many people. It's been the coolest thing in the world. You get vulnerable at that point. That means that's vulnerable. That's, like, oh man, I could be in big trouble for this. Oh, this could happen. Who knows? Doesn't matter. I'm going to do what's right. It is the coolest thing. Verse number nine, Jordan. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from okay. off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Okay. Gilgal is roll away. It has the idea of the foreskin. It has rolling away. All right, now listen to this. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day. This is the very day have I rolled away the reproach, the shame of Egypt. Somebody's got to help me on this. Rolled away the shame, the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Okay. So the whole idea is Gilgal is the rolling away, the cutting away, the rolling away. Of the shame of Egypt. Now I got a bunch of questions. Number one, who's ashamed? Number two, what is the shame of Egypt? What in the world is going on here? Because this is so pivotal to the, in the rest of this book. Does anyone have a clue? What is the reproach of Egypt? What is the shame of Egypt? It's okay. Think a little bit. Let me throw out a couple more questions to help you. Let's talk about, first of all, who. Um, who's getting the shame off? Who is not going to be ashamed anymore? Who? Israel. Israel. 
I won't disagree with that, but I don't think that's a key player here. God? Who? God? Yes. Okay, so, testimony time. So, I get saved at 12. Um, my mom and dad get divorced at 14. I, I, I am saved in a church that I, I probably say the church was Billy Graham. In other words, we heard the good gospel, but there wasn't much separation going on, okay? I thank God for Bluefield Hills Baptist Church. I really do. I come out of the Catholic Church, and, and it was they were having revival at that church. I mean, God was doing some people all over the northern Detroit area were getting saved at Bluefield Hills Baptist Church, and the youth group was exciting, but there wasn't too much on the separation part, anyhow. So uh, mom and dad get uh, divorced at 14, at 15... Mom and I move up to northern Michigan. My other siblings are out of the house. I'm the baby of the family. They're out of the house. I go up. Okay, so I get saved at 12. The youth group at Bluefield Hills Baptist Church was really exciting. I got a part of that. But I still had a lot of friends that were not living for God whatsoever. Drugs came into my middle school. My middle school was 7th, 8th, ninth grade. I don't know what yours was. But my middle school was 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. By ninth grade, I mean, all of my friends are smoking dope already. Taking, they're taking chemicals. Uh, they're drinking every weekend. And these were all my friends. We all had dirt bikes. We all played sports. And we did stuff together. Even though I trust Christ as my Savior, I go into stuff right away in my life I should have never gotten into. Mom and Dad get a divorce. I think God spares me from the Detroit area and moves me up to a very rural country area in northern Michigan, a little place called Leland, Michigan. Absolutely gorgeous. Leland, Michigan, on the Lake Michigan. We lived on a Lake Leland. Awe. It was just a beautiful area. I don't live for God at all. I'm very popular. I get to be the president of the student body. Um, I have a lot of friends. It's a small school. We're all kind of family together. But no one's saved. I don't witness to anybody. You see me at 16, and you would go, yeah, like he's not a Christian. But I do believe I got saved at 12. I really do. Somehow, some way, amazingly, the pastor of Bible Baptist Church of Traverse City, his name was Pastor Nixon, he encouraged me to go to Bob Jones. And I said, yeah, I didn't go to Bob Jones. This is going to be like pink and blue sidewalks. It's like a prison. I'm never going to go to a place like Bob Jones. It's going to be terrible. He said, would you go to Liberty University? It was just starting up, 1970s. I said, man, Liberty's too strict for me. I'll never make it at Liberty. He gave me a, a little brochure. I thought it said Pepsi-Cola Christian College. I really did. I never heard of Pepsi-Cola before. I thought it said Pepsi-Cola Christian College. I went like, wow, I read the book. It was $1,200 a year. I thought by the pictures, the college was right on the beach. And I thought, this is going to be the greatest thing in the world. I'm going to go to Florida. I'm going to have girls. And this is going to, I get to go to college. And it's so cheap. I can't go wrong with it. That was $1,200 a year for room, board, and tuition, by the way. And, uh, and I said, so I'm going. So I go down to Pensacola, find out it's not on the beach, and find out it's more stricter than Bob Jones. And I went like, whoa, what in the world happened? But God got a hold of my heart. By the end of my freshman year, God did a work in my life. I truly believe I was saved, guys, at age 12, but it was at age 18 I started living for the Lord. Now, I say all that to tell you this. Israel is saved out of Egypt. Guys, they were saved out of Egypt. It is absolutely a picture of their salvation. They are no longer under the bondage of Egypt. But for 40 years, they wandered. I wandered for six years of my life. I think this happens to be one of the reasons why I love teenagers so much. I wasted my teen years, and I want to see that generation live for God because I think it's a great time to live for God, and I did not. I get saved at 18, and I believe, or you know, I get saved at 12. At 18, I dedicate my life to the Lord. I think I start living Galatians 2.20. I start dying to self, and I start living the victorious Christian life. Now listen to me. I think... From 12 to 18, I think Satan said, Hey, hey God, look at your little Jimmy boy. Look, look what he did on Friday night. Hey, look at your look at your little Jimmy boy. Look at look at look look at his attitude towards his his mom that he lives with. Hey, look at your little Jimmy boy. How do you like his language? 
I think for six years of my life, God was ashamed of me. I do. I think God said, you know, I love you. You have my son's righteousness upon you. But you're ashamed, Jim. Look at the way you're living. I think God, you know, I think God was ashamed of Jim Shepard. Sure he was. Man, the way I was living. Hey, hey, look at your little Christian boy. Jimmy, how's he doing? And you know what? I gave my life over to the Lord at 18. I started living for the Lord. And you know what? I think there was the shame. And then I look back at my teen years, and I have so much regret. And I go like, oh, I got so much shame in my teen years. I think it all rolled away. I think that's what happens here. I think God says, you know what? You are going to start living a victorious. You, Israel, you're going to start seeing victory. You have been, you have put my name ashamed. Because by the way, everyone in Egypt is saying this. Hey, that God that delivered Israel out of Egypt <laughs> can't get them in the promised land. Hey, that great God that brought all those plagues can't even get them into, a, into another land. They're just wandering around. They just wander. They're like little pinballs. They just wander around the wilderness. What a shame to God. What a terrible testimony that they were to God's name. Because everyone, you know, everyone like, oh yeah, the God of those Israelite people, yeah, he got them out of Egypt, but he doesn't even know where to go with them now. They just wander around. And God, there was shame. And I think right here at Gilgal, God says, we're rolling it all the way, guys. Now your life is going to change. Now it's going to be different. Let's look at what we got. Roman number or number one. Gilgal was a place of remembrance. Now that's what we've been just covering, so we'll go through this pretty quick. It was a place of remembrance. That this may be a sign. This would be chapter four. This would be the stones again. That when your children ask their fathers, you're going to go back to Gilgal and say, hey, remember what God did in the Jordan River. Small a, never forget Never forget what God has done for you, in you, and with you. Never forget what God has done for you, in you, and with you. Small b. The only two reasons to go into your past are to see God's love and to remember God's lessons. Okay, we covered that already. Small c. Israel always return to Gilgal after every campaign, whether it was victory or defeat. And why did they keep coming back to Gilgal? So they would go out, they would have a victory, and then they would always come back to Gilgal. Why? To remember who God is, to remember what God had done, to remember why they were in the promised land, and to remember how to keep having victory. Now it's going to be really interesting. They don't go back to Gilgal. They go right to Ai, and they don't come back to Gilgal, and then they get defeated you got to keep coming back to Gilgal. you got to keep remembering who God is. you got to keep remembering what God's done. And you got to keep remembering why they were in the promised land. you got to keep remembering how to keep it to have victory. All right, let me tell you something. You're at this point in the semester. I, I call it a semester. I guess they're not semesters anymore. Right now, guys, some of you need to get back to Gilgal. Some of you right now are struggling here a little bit. Some of you right now need to remember why you came to college. Because now it's like, you know what, I'm really getting tired of these restrictions now. you got to get back to Gilgal. you got to remember why the Lord has you here and what he's doing with you and where it's been. I, guys, constantly in my life i got to go back to Gilgal. i got to remember Galatians 2.20. i got to die to myself again. Pride starts coming up. My will, what I want, starts coming back up again. And i got to go back to Galatians 2.20. I got to get back to Gilgal. Large, small d. We should return often to an old rugged cross and an empty tomb. There's three activities that occurred at Gilgal over four days. Okay, what verse did we end up reading? Uh, Joe, did you read verse eight? Who read verse eight? Who read verse? No, verse nine. Who read verse nine? Thank you, Jordan. Hey, we're gonna go over here, Kyler. You got verse ten, guys. Listen to this. Go ahead. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. Okay. Okay, so we got, we just heard the third thing that has just occurred. Number one, 
They built the rocks. Memorial. Number two, circumcision. The shame has passed away. Let's go forward now. You're my covenant people. Let's get it right with God. Trust me and, 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 and start obeying me. Okay, so we got to play. Number three, what happens? What do they do? They have the what? Passover. What was the last time they had Passover, guys? When was the last time they had a Passover? When they left Egypt. What? When they left Egypt. No. They have it one more year, a year later. And then they haven't had it since. 39 years they haven't had the Passover. Okay, so let's, let's look at what we got here. Three activities occurred at Gilgal. Number one, Gilgal was a place of, well, number one, was repentance. Number two, it was a place, okay, now, it says renunciation. I changed that. Put down the word repentance. Gilgal was a place of repentance to renounce, to give up, or put aside, declare one's abandonment of a claim, right, or possession. The Lord had brought them to Gilgal to renounce their unbelieving, ungodly, and unholy living in the wilderness and be wholly committed to their God by an act of obedience called circumcision. Circumcision identified Israel as God's covenant people. Circumcision purified Israel for God's crowning purpose. Listen to Jeremiah 4.4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, let my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. And Romans 2, 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil and the Jew first and also the Jew. Okay, I think that's the wrong verse. I'm sorry. Jeremiah 4, 4, though. That is a great verse on, on the circumcision. Look at small b. Circumcision was a huge step of faith for two reasons. Number one, it stopped their momentum. Yeah, it stopped their momentum. Number two, it put them at risk. Gilgal means to roll away. After Israel was circumcised, God rolled away the shame they had carried from Egypt for not seeing God give them victory. Have you renounced, have you repented your old life and died with Christ on the cross? Is self still reigning on the throne of your life? You've got to, I am crucified with Christ. This is it at Gilgal. All right, so we got that all? Number three, Gilgal was a place of restoration. Gilgal was a place of restoration. This was, oh, guys, I am sorry. This was only the third, oh yeah, this was the third time, right. They did, they did it uh, the night of the Passover. They did it one year later, and now this is the third time. That's right. This was only the third time in 40 years they had celebrated the Passover. They could only have it after circumcision was restored. Listen to that in Exodus 12, 48. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord. Let all his males be circumcised. Then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as one that is born in the land. So this is really interesting. So they, they didn't have the Passover because they weren't circumcising. So because they weren't right with God, now they're not doing the next thing that they were supposed to have is the Passover. The Passover restored their proper worship to the Lord and their fellowship with God. Immediate obedience produced instant restoration, renewal, and revival. Ooh, this is good. Okay, so now that they have finally circumcised, now they're able to have the Passover again. And that's going to restore their relationship with the Lord. They repented. And then they restored the relationship. Now, guys, that is really, really important. Because repentance comes before restoration. They had to get right with God before they could be restored with God. 
And I think a lot of times we are praying, God, restore us, send revival. And God is saying, turn from your sin. Turn from your sin, and I will bring the revival. I will bring the renewal. He's expecting us to take that step first. That is, that done. the order is very important. They did the circumcision, then they had the Passover. Okay? Any comments, questions, or illustrations? It's really cool what's happening here. Let's go to the third. Now, I have to tell you this. The very first time I ever read this, I went like, oh, that's really sad. That's too bad. I looked at this as a bad thing. This is not a bad thing. And you guys are going to tell me why. Let's look at the next one. Where are we? Uh, Jason, you got the next verse? Did you read a verse yet? Not yet. All right, go to verse 11. We find out what it, the next thing that happens. Okay. So we've got the remembrance. They, got the, they put the memorial rocks. Number two, they had the circumcision. Number three, they had the Passover. So we got three major things that have occurred at Gilgal. We got one more major thing that's going to happen at Gilgal. Go ahead. And they did eat of, of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and, pop, and parched corn in the self same day. Okay, so first thing I want to say about this is when you first read this, does old corn sound good or bad? <laughs> it didn't sound good, does it? But it's really good. This is the harvest corn, okay? I know it sounds as a, oh, yeah, the old corn. No, no, this is the ripe corn. This is, that's what it really means, ripe, it's done. I know when I first read I'm like, old corn, ooh, that's too bad. And look at what they lost. Go ahead, next verse, verse 12. And the man of cease on the morrow after they had eaten up the old corn on the land, neither had the children of the church of Israel seen that anymore, but they did eat up the fruit of the land. Oh, this is so cool. Okay, so I just want to tell you guys that the first time I read this, I went, oh, look at me in it. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, you're shaking your head. Well, I didn't. I was going like, oh, man, this is a really bad thing. No more man. Why is this a phenomenal thing? Emily. Now they get to see God's promise fulfilled that they're in this land of milk and honey. Yeah. So they get to eat of the fruits of the land. They, get, they start eating the fruits of the land. Hey, by the way, guys, what the land was to Israel, Christ, Christ is to us. Christ is to us. The manna's got to cease in order for us to really start experiencing Jesus Christ in our life. Okay. She's right on it. She's got the right answer. Can you can you add more to that answer? Yeah, Candace. Um, they probably wouldn't have uh, appreciated the corn and stuff as much if they still had been a, like, oh yeah, we still have like a plan we can fall back on. Oh, that's an excellent insight that I, I'd never thought of before. That's an excellent insight. By the way, what a great thing to put in your devotional guide. That would have been a great, that's a great, like really good truth for them. I, I promise you guys, I, what time does our class end? One or one fifteen. Let's take a break. Let's take a break right now, and then when we come back, we'll uh, we will um, we'll talk about uh, the, your paper, and then I want to get back to the Passover, or I want to get back to the the man of I want you to think what else is really good about it. Emily's giving you a great front porch. There's something else. It's actually what she did say, because now they're going to eat of the fruit of the land. But there's something that's really cool about it. How did they get the, what did they have to do for manna, guys? What did they have to do for the manna? Yeah, basically nothing, but basically just go gather it. They were kind of being spoon fed. Okay, remember those days? Hey, no, nobody remembers. We were really little. Okay, take it, take it, just get up, just stand up and stretch a little. Because what I got to say is really good at the end here. Show me your papers right now. I'll be glad to look at them. I want just to. Oh, let's see your schedule. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you put uh, chapters three and four together. 
five and six again. I like I like your I like your reading thing. So. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. That's okay. That's what it is. It's okay. And I can't say that that's good. I can't say that's bad. A hey, hey, couple of your questions aren't too bad. Okay. What do you got? Oh. I lost some Anyone else want to show me your papers? I lost it for a second. Okay. 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 By the way, after I go through the, if you think like, you know, Doc, I think I did that. The new one, you know, team. I think it's simple because I have one because I do one. I think it's that. So this one. First of all, there's no blanks to write in the answers. So the scripture. What's talking about application? 